one day I was working and Shane walked in and he said, I'm in a rehab program down the street at Women Walker Clinic and I've, I've been clean for six weeks. Will you give me a job? And I said, no. The story like ensues sort of in a funny way. I eventually started paying him because he just showed up every day and started working. And it's funny because he's like, did I bully my way into that job? I'm like, yeah, in a really good way. I needed him and he needed me, I think is what ultimately ended up happening. And Shane ended up helping a lot of other folks from the Whitman Walker program find us and in turn helped me find really great teammates. And so it, it didn't happen on purpose. It was very organic in a wonderful way. And before I knew it, people were joking that we could have, you know, an AA meeting in the plumbing department or an NA meeting in the hardware department. And most days we probably could. And then they told you your business had a nickname that you didn't even know. Yeah, I cried that day. It was really meaningful. So Mark Watson, who's one of the uh, top leaders on our team, has worked with us for 19 years now, came to me one day and he said, you know, the community calls this place recovery hardware. And I think I said this to you in warm up, Anthony, you can't give yourself a nickname. And I couldn't think of anything more poignant, more special to be called. And it really set us off me personally, because I wrote the book with that name on this trajectory of, should I be talking about the folks we hire? Why aren't other people doing the same thing? What other businesses in the country do similar things to us that I wanna figure out how to celebrate and talk about? So it was a big moment. Have you ever noticed that some of the best ideas come from unexpected places? Your next breakthrough may come from a leader facing similar challenges, but in a completely different sector. Welcome to Chief Influencer. I'm your host, Anthony Shop. Join us as we explore how today's successful leaders inspire, influence, and connect with others. Chief Influencer is a production of Social Driver and the Communications Board, who have teamed up to spotlight how great leaders and communicators are making their impact in the world. This episode is brought to you by the George Washington University's College of Professional Studies. With in-person and online programs, ranging from master's degrees in public relations strategy to certificate programs in digital communications, GW offers more than just the credentials to help working professionals get ahead. It prepares them to be leaders in their field. As a proud GW graduate myself, I can attest that faculty members combine academic rigor with real world lessons that can't always be found in textbooks. Check out cps.gwu.edu for more information. I am so excited to introduce today's guest, Gina Schaefer. Gina has been called a visionary in the retail industry. She redefines what it means to shop, support, and promote local. She's the board chair and co-founder of a few cool hardware stores. Don't you love it when the name of the company describes exactly what it does? A few cool hardware stores started as just one Ace Hardware store, in fact, and grew to a chain of 13 stores with now more than 300 employees. How did they do it? Gina has been recognized for building a strong corporate culture and advocating for the return to Main Street movement. In her book, Recovery Hardware, Gina details how what began as an effort to help her community recover evolved into a safe space for countless people in recovery from substance use disorders. Her team members could rebuild their lives as they helped rebuild a community. Recovery Hardware, I have it right here, it is such an inspiring read. I hope you'll check it out. We're gonna talk a lot about it. Some call Gina a chief localist, but today we are thrilled to recognize her as a chief influencer. Welcome, Gina. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you for calling me a chief influencer. I think that's probably one of the neatest things I've ever been called in my life. Well, you are a chief influencer. You know, we look for leaders in different industries who stand above their peers. And I just think as an advocate for local business, as a local business owner, uh, there's so many reasons why you jump out and why we are excited to spend time with you today. So thank you for making the time for this. And I just want to start, you know, uh, we believe some of the most effective leaders, they are more than chief executives. They are what we call chief influencers. And so I want to start by asking, who have you had to influence to achieve the impact that you want to see in your community and in the world? Wow. Who haven't I had to influence? It seems like I, you know, I think if we go back to the very beginning and the business started in 2003, 
I really had to influence the people who um, run the ACE cooperative at the, at the corporate level. So ACE is not a franchise, we're a co-op, and a lot of people don't know that. And to be able to open an urban location with no hardware experience, I really had to pull some punches. I mean, I, um, I had to brag about things that I shouldn't have been bragging about. I had to, you know, in, I had to influence, essentially. Um, and then the next step after that was the, the landlord to get the space and really the community to shop with us. And so it, at its bare basic, from the very beginning, we, I have had to influence a lot of folks to be able to make the business work. One of the things that really came through to me in your story is that from the very beginning, you really wanted to make a difference in the community, but you talk about how making that impact on the outside, you had to start even with cashiers, right? Inside your store. Can you talk a little bit about that and the importance of influence on the inside of an organization to achieve that influence on the outside? Well, I think a lot of times people come to retail not with a different perspective on work, but not necessarily as a permanent job or as a career. And when you're trying to build a business, you need every single body inside the business to be affecting everyone who walks through the doors. And so I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're getting at, but for us, it was making sure that if you were a cashier, especially if this was your first job, you had to realize, we had to help you realize what your impact was on the business as a whole, because you were the first person that every customer that walked through that door was going to see, especially when we first started. So um, it, everything was very raw at that point in Logan Circle. There weren't a lot of businesses to shop in. There were a lot of mixed expectations, um, sometimes really high because we were the only place to go in the neighborhood, almost the only place to go in the neighborhood. And so we really had to start treating our team as if they were starting a career, which we thought they were, um, even if they didn't see it that way. You mentioned in the book, you don't have to be professionals to be professional. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, society places these um, titles on people. You're a director, you're a manager, you're a leader, you're X, Y, and Z, you're a mechanic even, but they don't place the same value all the time on retail workers. And we often had a lot of folks who came in with um, maybe fragile self-confidence as an example, and they didn't have to be a plumber to be able to do really well in the plumbing department. You have to speak respectfully for, to people, which is one of our strong core values. You have to be nice, be a good neighbor, all of the things that just make you approachable and easy to talk to. And then the skills develop over time. And so you didn't have to be a professional welder, woodworker, carpenter, gardener. You just had to be professional when you were talking to the person in front of you. And, and that was a big lesson for us in the early days. You know, I, I've been in your stores before. Your business is known for having exceptional customer service. And obviously, you know, even when you have one store, you can't be there all the time. But when you have 13 stores, okay, definitely that's <laughs> <No>. impossible. <laughs> so I want to talk about um, how you build that culture of service. But maybe even before we get into that, Talk about recovery hardware and the type of workforce you've cultivated, because um, many people may not be aware, you know, why, why is it called recovery hardware? It's such a great book. Where did this name come from? Maybe take us back and tell us a little bit about that story. Sure. So first of all, I, I love the fact that you've read it and you understand it and, and it resonated with you. I really appreciate that. We opened in Logan Circle, uh, right uh, around 2003, and there weren't a lot of opportunities for people to get jobs, nor were there a lot of uh, local residents who needed a job. Um, but there was the Whitman Walker Clinic down the street. And so one day I was working, I love the story. And, and Shane, who is the, the teammate who um, plays into the story, walked in and he said, I'm in a rehab program down the street at Whitman Walker Clinic. And I've, I've been clean for six, six weeks, I think. Um, will you give me a job? And I said, no. The story like ensues sort of in a funny way. I eventually, I, I eventually started paying him because he just showed up every day and started working. I mean, he like it, it's funny because he's like, did I bully my way into that job? I'm like, yeah, in a really good way. Um, I needed him and he needed me. I think is what ultimately ended up happening. Um, and I, I won't give uh, the story away, but Shane ended up helping a lot of other folks from the Whitman Walker program find us. And in turn, helped me find really great teammates. And so it, it didn't happen on purpose. It was very organic in a wonderful way. And 
before I knew it, people were joking that we could have, you know, an AA meeting in the plumbing department or an NA meeting in the hardware department. And most days we probably could. And then they told you your business had a nickname that you didn't even know. Yeah, I cried that day. It was really meaningful. So Mark Watson, who's one of the uh, top leaders on our team, has worked with us for 19 years now, came to me one day and he said, you know, the, the, the community calls this place Recovery Hardware. And I think I said this to you in warm up, Anthony, you can't give yourself a nickname. And I couldn't think of anything uh, more poignant, uh, more special to be called. And it really set us off, me personally, because I wrote the book with that name on this trajectory of, should I be talking about the folks we hire? Why aren't other people doing the same thing? What other businesses in the country do similar, um, similar things to us that I want to figure out how to celebrate and talk about? So it was a, it was a big moment. And that wasn't always easy, was it, to um, to be recovery hardware and to have folks who were going through struggles? No, you know, any business is challenging. And I had I had a teammate once who very in a very funny way said, "Gosh, this business would be a lot easier if we didn't have employees or customers." <laughs> and this was actually one of my sales associates, and so they were they were an employee. But I said, "Yeah, sort of," because everybody everybody comes to work with experiences. And so everybody brings some sort of challenge, but when you layer on top of that, the fragility of someone in recovery, um, it, it is extra. I mean, I like to think that it's no different, but it is, it is an extra layer of, um, experience that we have to, we have to handle for me personally. I mean, if somebody went back out, which is the phrase that's used when you start using drugs again, you know, it was very painful. I mean, those felt like, breakups in some cases, uh, you know, it brought out every ounce of mom in me and I'm not technically a mom. Um, so it was, it's, it's been tough, but super rewarding too. When I first picked up the book, I wondered if, you know, I'm not somebody who is, uh, really adept with all of the hardware and, you know, plumbing and those things. So I kind of wondered if that was going to be a focus and yet it was so much about people. And there were so many lessons that you've learned over the years that you shared. One um, that I think is such a great lesson with people around us, but maybe even ourselves, is is, uh, a quote, don't judge anyone by the worst thing they've ever done. Can you talk about that lesson? Yeah. um, The very first teammate who stole from us was a young college educated guy, had never been in prison, had never been in recovery. Like all of the, the naysayers that I've met over the years would specifically pinpoint the folks that we, were, that we were hiring who were in those categories. And then all of a sudden we hired this kid, basically. He was 23 and college educated and articulate. And he stole $3,000 from us. And I mean, I could have held that against everyone who worked with me, or I could have just realized that people are going to do dumb things, bad things, inappropriate things sometimes. And the way we grow a business is rolling with those things. The recovery time as a business owner um, is what's important in this lesson. And so, I mean, he was terminated. That was, it's a fireable offense, but I wasn't going to hold it against him. And I certainly wasn't going to hold it against anybody who came in who already had a criminal background, knowing that it doesn't matter if you have a criminal background or not, you can still do things that are nefarious or inappropriate. So um, it was actually my husband, Mark, who said, you can't judge everyone, uh, anyone by the best or worst thing they ever did. And it really stuck with me, um, especially throughout writing the book. Yeah, it really comes through that, that lesson. Um, something that really struck me, you know, reading about your experiences is obviously this idea of chief influencer, you have to influence others around you. And that's part of what we're talking about, but you gave some great examples about how you have to allow others to influence you as a leader so that you can make the right decisions for your team, for your business, for your customers. Can you share some of the examples about how you allowed your team or your customers to influence you as a leader and you know, be open-minded and listen to them and follow their advice? Well, first of all, I know nothing, right? I mean, I started in the hardware business without any retail experience, without any hardware experience. And so I really felt like there was no way I could act like or profess to know what I was doing, which meant I had to learn from everyone around me. Um, The whole genesis of the book really was thinking about the non-traditional teachers that I have. So people put teachers um, into particular categories. They have an education, they've had a trajectory through the higher educational system or what have you. Uh, They're not 
guys, for example, who have come out of, out of the local jail system or prison system. And I started thinking about moments in time where I've learned something. And let me give you an example. My uh, teammate, Eric, um, I was having a particularly hard time with the store that we'd purchased. And my teammate, Eric said, it's better to be respected than liked. And everybody listening to this might have already learned that lesson. But at that moment in my life, I wanted everyone to like me. I didn't, that was what was most important to me. And Eric, who had, uh, was a high school dropout, had been in prison, had you know, all of the things that people would think, you know, how could you learn from someone like Eric? And he sat me down one day and he said, they need to respect you. They don't have to like you. And it hit me over the head. Um, and, and I'll never forget it. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote about him because it was a, it was a big deal. Um, I mean, I can go on, like Shane likes to say, don't give up five minutes before the miracle. And I think that's not a phrase that he coined, but it means, Anthony, you can be doing something really great five minutes from now. But if I decide to not listen or to not wait, I might miss that miracle. And I think everybody has a miracle coming. Um, some of it, some of us need it pulled out of us, I guess, but yeah. I love that. And that lesson, you know, comes through because I think one of the examples you, um, shared was about like carrying specific products even and just listening to your team maybe fabuloso was one of those if i'm remembering yeah that right. oh yeah, yeah 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 that was a big one well you know think about it so we have 300 teammates i'm not in 13 stores i'm not on the floor nor are my buyers on the floor that often we really rely on our team to be the eyes and ears with the customers and when customers come in and they're asking for the same product over and over again and we don't have it we need to have it and so Fabuloso was one, you know, we have, it started out really, um, a really popular product in the Lat Latino community. Um, and my teammates heard that loud and clear. And so we started carrying it. We started carrying houseplants because, you know, this generation is so excited about houseplants that we sell thousands of them now. And if I weren't willing to listen and if my teammates weren't paying attention, um, you know, now I, maybe we'll talk a little bit about this later, but we've sold 30% of the business to the team through an ESOP. And so they literally are the owners now. And so I want them to think like, think like that. How can we sell more things to the people coming in uh, that they want and need? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's just that, that listening to, to bring what folks need into the store. I love the plant example. You talked about pet <laughs> toys and, you know, there's a bunch of stuff just based on the locality and, you know, that's such an interesting approach as a leader to keep core values that tie 13 stores together, but allow each of those stores to have its own culture based on the neighborhood and, and based on the team. That's kind of a delicate balance, isn't it? Um, it is. It is a delicate balance. It was very hard. You know, early on, people had said, well, not early. They hadn't said, but the statistic was at the time that most independent hardware store owners only owned one location. Um, and I took that to heart, you know, we opened in Logan circle. I don't know if I really thought we were going to expand, but very quickly after we opened, people started coming in from around the city saying, Hey, will you open in our neighborhood? Which is not only terrifying, but, you know, super exciting to think about the possibilities. And so it very quickly became apparent that perhaps there was a way that we could grow this business in a, in a much bigger way. And by that point, my husband had joined me. We were business partners. We were growing and, um, we had, we had to listen um, it's so funny. Sometimes I babble, Anthony, and I forget exactly what the question is. But we had to figure out how we were going to be in two places at once because all of these, you know, old hardware store owners were saying you can't have two stores because you can't be in two places at once. Obvious that you can't, right? But we needed that culture to to continue, and so we created the core values with the help of our team, and then we took someone who was on the team to the second location and made them the manager, and all of that started to pervade, and, and it really, really showed its worth when we opened our first location in Baltimore. And the manager who helped us open that location, John, had worked at our Glover Park location. And we said, we're going to send you an hour away. He actually wanted to move to Baltimore. Can you handle it? And he said, I have the framework. I have a year of experience working with you. I understand the company's core values. In fact, they're documented. And so he moved to Baltimore. And then we ended up opening three stores there with his help. And he was fantastic. Same sort of cultural mentality, um, you know, yeah, it works. That, something that comes through from the couple decades of growth and expansion that you've had, that you talk about in the book, um, I, I think there's a lot of times we hear individuals, sometimes business owners, describe what they do as 
just like, well, I oh. just do this. And you sort of talk about this transformation of going from saying, I just run a hardware store to realizing it can be so much more. It can make such an impact in the community. Can you just talk about that? How you change the way you see your business and how that changed the way others see your business? And you know what lessons do you have for other leaders who might sometimes find themselves in that just mentality? Yeah, I'm writing a new, a new keynote address right now, and I'm using just as a four-letter word in one of my sentences because I really, I, I, I started to reflect on it as kind of an insult. Uh, we have 300 employees. We're in five cities. We are a $50 million business. Like there is no just in any of that. It's a, it's, it's, it's a lot of moving parts, but I kept thinking we're a little retail business. And again, part of this was me thinking about perhaps some societal stigma. You know, we've gotten to this point where we're either consumed with the big boxes or we're not thinking about local retail because we're shopping online. And, you know, what is the niche? Where do we fill in? And I do think there's a place for us. And I often tell people, you know, close your eyes and think about a main street that you love. You're not thinking about Target. You're not thinking about Amazon. This is not that there's anything wrong with those businesses, but you're thinking about the local business. And that is a lot of pressure on us local business owners. And when you're one of those and you're saying, well, I just run the local hardware store, you're really selling yourself short. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to take that message to other businesses and, and frankly, businesses that are, that are smaller than, than what we're operating right now, because that's the group of people that I think need to hear it because they're the ones that are making our communities interesting. Yeah. And you say, obviously now at the scale that you are, you realize it's not a just, but even in the story that you described earlier, when you were one location serving a community and Shane, it was Shane, I believe, who kept yeah. showing up until you, okay, I'll pay you to unload that truck or whatever <laughs> it was. Um, you weren't a just then either. I mean, that you were a very important part of his life in that moment, even if he hadn't stayed with you as long as he had. And I think that's such a powerful message for whether you're a business owner or a leader in another sector, because obviously we touch on all kinds of sectors with Chief Influencer, um, that mindset shift of not, well, I just do this, but realizing you can make a huge impact and that ripple effect. And there's there was a quote that kind of jumped out to me. I think it was 11 years in to the business when you moved locations. And so, you know, you weren't tied to this physical space anymore that was the business, right? You were, it, it was more than just that. And you all participated in the pride parade going down the street. And you said, yeah. and I'm kind of abbreviating here. It's not the four physical walls that had propped us up for over a decade that made our store a success. It's the community, the community. ones we build and the ones that surround us and the ones that work with us. And I just love that message of mm. community business, Gina. And I just love for you to talk a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, Logan Circle was everything for our kickoff. And we had the, the benefit this past year of celebrating our 20th anniversary. And to celebrate, we invited 20 of our original customers who are still our customers. So basically, they've watched us from infancy get to uh, this 20-year mark. And you know, I always say we only get it right 60% of the time. It's, small businesses are often judged by a different set of standards, and they're really tough standards. And I never want anyone to think that even though we provide good customer service, that it's, it's, <laughs> I like to think it's consistent, but you know, I'm not delusional. Uh, those customers that came to that event were just really great reminders that people have continued to support us over the years. We would not be where we are without them. People have to come in to our four walls and spend their money. But by being a part of a broader community and us not getting stuck in those four walls, we've had a chance to interact in a lot of really cool ways that we were able to expand in a bunch of places. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's kind of how I think about it. It's been very mutually supportive. Yeah. Yeah. When we think about the type of community that you build on the inside and, you know, maybe going back to even customer service, you've had the opportunity, you served on the board of um, Ace Hardware and mm -hmm. um, that gave you the opportunity to see other hardware stores around the country and to learn lessons, sometimes probably observing things that are great that you want to emulate and sometimes maybe observing things that you don't want to emulate. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Um, yes. So that was a very eye-opening experience. Um, Ace is an amazing company. It'll, it'll be a hundred years old in 2024. Um, and the principles, there are several principles that guide cooperatives. One is cooperating with other co-ops. And for me, in this case, joining the, the, the board allowed me to meet and cooperate with other members around the country. It's a, it's a very supportive community. And so that was really good. But that also means that a business owner in Washington, D.C. is cooperating with a business owner in Montana and Florida and California. And we are very different. <laughs> I mean, at our heart, we're all Americans, but there are a lot of differences across the country. And so um, me getting out of the D.C. bubble and being able to interact on a national scale was very, very educational. I don't think the story made it into the book, but I, I love to think about um, I would always fly in and out of O'Hare airport and I like to sit in the window seat and I would, it was like a movie set. Every single time I would leave these meetings, I would sit in the window seat, I would raise the shade and I would look out on the tarmac and there would be an airplane on fire. And it was because they always practiced, the firefighters always practiced at O'Hare putting out fires. And I saw every single time, and I had to fly into O'Hare like four times a year. And I thought to myself, this is my board service. This is my, my, uh, growth as a, particularly as a female on a corporate board is a, you know, $5 billion company. Um, I'm going up in flames. I just made a fool of myself. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and then I finally realized in the last day that, that you have to practice. You're not going to be good. The first time you do something, you're not going to be great on your first board, maybe not even your second board. Those firefighters were putting out that plane every week or every month, whatever the cadence was when I was flying in. Uh, because they knew they had to practice. And that was a good reminder for me too. Um, I didn't have to be great just because I already owned 10 stores. There was so much more to learn. There's still so much more to learn. Um, and being on that board was what really set me down that path. I wonder if, um, th this isn't in the book, but you mentioned to me another time, and if you don't want to talk about it, we can edit it out, an experience you had, because I asked you, you know, how do you cultivate this, like where your employees are always asking people they need help with something. It's just such a welcoming <laughs> environment. And you um, shared an experience that you had visiting another ACE hardware that, that mm. maybe the experience wasn't the same. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think so. I think I was probably talking about a store that I visited out West where the owners didn't introduce me to his teammates. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Um, and I, I remember, I remember being really put off by that because you know, these are our coworkers, people, you can say what you will about calling your company or your, your team, your family, but these are the people that I spend every day with. And so when people come into the business, I want them to meet my family. I want to introduce them. And, and I wasn't in that particular case. And so um, I think at its very base, that starts building the culture when you have that respect and you say hello and goodbye. And again, I think this sort of goes back to the way retail workers have, um, it, especially over the last two decades, been treated. Um, and, and not wanting to, not wanting to be part of that, right. Not wanting to feed into that, that part of the culture. Yeah. And that, you know, the, the examples you give about listening to your team in terms of what products that you should carry and, um, you know, just, just interacting with them and introducing to others that leads to something you mentioned earlier is that you decided to create an ESOP. Can you talk yeah. about the decision that, you know, led to that and what that means for folks who aren't familiar yeah. So this is probably, the, well, I was going to say the most exciting. I've got so many exciting things that I, <laughs> I could talk about all day long. Um, from the beginning of starting the business in 2003, people had said to me, what's your exit strategy? And I, and I think that was for a couple of reasons. Uh, hardware is a very multi-generational business and my husband and I don't have children. And so I think it came a lot of times from the dad's question, uh, you know, what are you going to do with this business? You don't have kids to, to pass it on to. Um, and then just also now being smarter about, you know, the baby boomer generation retiring and closing businesses, and businesses surviving. So um, people were asking me, I didn't have time. I was busy growing the business. And then the pandemic hit and all of the protests started. And my office overlooks 14th Street and Logan Circle. And a lot of the protests marched down 14th Street. And as you know, you know, in the 60s, when Martin Luther King was assassinated and the riots swept down 14th Street it became a very different place. And I tell that story a lot when I'm speaking around the country because I want people to know or feel what Logan Circle was like when I moved there in the 90s. I'm still recovering from that incident. And all of a sudden, these protests were happening again. And I could look out my window and I could see them. And I remember Mark saying one day, maybe we can do something. Like you could see the smoke coming out of his ears. Like maybe there's a small thing that we can do. There's a quote that I, that I really love. And it's, I always wondered when somebody was going to do something about that. And I realized I was somebody. 
And I think that speaks to, Anthony, you don't have to save the world. You don't have to save everybody. You don't have to cure cancer or stop hunger. But if you can stop one person from being hungry or you can help one person with a job, you're somebody. And so when Mark said, I think we can do something about this, we started talking about selling the business to a manager, selling it to a group of employees. And we stumbled upon an ESOP, an employee stock ownership program. Um, essentially, the business buys the business on behalf of the employees and holds it in a trust. And we started to educate ourselves on what that means. There's about 6,000 in the country, so there's not enough. Um, I like to think of us as unicorns. And we met some mentors, one of whom actually is another Ace Hardware Store owner and a couple nonprofit folks who, uh, whose sole mission is to educate people on ESOPs. And that was it. We made our plan. And it started because of those protests and grew. It took us about two years to put the whole thing into place. And we have at this point sold 30% of the business to the team. Yeah. i sorry. That was, I really babbled there. <laughs> oh, that was great. And so when folks wonder, wow, why is there such good service? Why do so many of these people act like they own the place? The reason they do, <laughs> they do. And I just think that is the coolest thing. Um, cause Thank I didn't you. know that until you told me. And, uh, and, and I think that, you know, it really shows, I mean, it's, it's one of the secrets to the success of your business, because for anybody Thank who you. hasn't been to one of your stores, it's just an excellent, I mean, you know, we all know these days, we all have lots of negative customer service experiences. And when you repeatedly yeah have a positive customer service experience. I don't know. I mean, for me, at least I remember that. And yeah. you think, okay, who's behind this, right? <laughs> what are they doing differently? Because it's not something most of us experience all the time. It's something that yeah. is somewhat rare these days. So um, that's pretty special. And I think, you know, Thanks. one of the reasons that even folks who, you know, I obviously live near some of your stores, but even folks who don't, they'll get a lot out of the book. Uh, recovery of hardware and the story because of just the culture that that you've built. So congratulations. Thank on you. That. Thank you. Um, okay. We've talking like big picture stuff, like culture. I'd love to talk a little bit about marketing because I think for so many leaders, sometimes leaders are not, they don't see themselves as marketing experts or they feel sort of uncomfortable with marketing. And I just love some of the things that you've done that are what I would say are maybe non-traditional marketing tactics. One that comes to mind for me is ladies night. Can you talk about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So ladies nights, ladies nights are awesome. So they started uh, specifically because we had, uh, so we have over the years built 10 stores from scratch and purchased five. And we've had two that failed. I hate to call them failures, but we had to close them. They both ran for 10 years before we closed them. And then, and then we had to shut them down. And our fifth street location, which was in the middle of Washington, DC, fifth and K street, Northwest um, was one of those locations. And for some reason, five years into that struggle, we thought maybe we just really need to invite the community in and have a party, but in a really big way. And there were other hardware store owners that had mentioned ladies nights. And we decided we were going to do that. We had 350 women show up to that first ladies night. And this is a store that ended up like closing. It never had enough business, but man, did that party resonate with the community and people loved it. And the sales were great. And so we decided that we were going to carry it on to other locations. And um, women have historically and in studies and research have, have documented that they don't feel comfortable in hardware stores. And we wanted to make sure that we were the absolute opposite of that. So that was the genesis of it. And then if you fast forward, especially to now, um, online businesses that are competition to us aren't throwing brick and mortar parties where you get to shake hands and share a piece of cake or candy or whatever with a customer. They're not doing that. And so it really became, a, oh my gosh, now we need to figure out how to differentiate. Um, folks live in our backyard. They could walk in. Let's have a party. Uh, and because ladies nights have been so fun, we and men come too. We definitely have men show up for ladies nights, but we have anywhere between probably 275. Our biggest was about 550 people. And we we had to change the process after that because it was actually too many people for our little locations. <laughs> we had to like set limits and have tickets and stuff. But They've been super successful. I think there's just some great lessons packed in that. You know, one, obviously, is you started this successful tactic at a store that ultimately you had to close, but you you took a great lesson out of that, right? By trying yes. something. And so, yes. you know, a phoenix rising from the ashes in a way, right? <laughs> Taking something positive from that. So that's pretty cool. I also love how it's a bit of a guerrilla marketing tactic to, you know, get word of mouth and show your focus on the community. 
And then, like you said earlier, you know, for folks who don't walk in the door, they may not know that you sell pet products and house plants and really cool local, you know, um, local products that are made by small businesses in DC. And I want yep. to talk about that a little bit, Gina, because you've really been an advocate for small and local businesses and um, carrying their products is one of the ways you've done that. Can you talk about that a little bit and what that means for those businesses and what that means for your business? Yeah. So that started, gosh, probably around 2010, I was on the board of Think Local First DC and whose mission was really to promote local businesses and, and provide opportunities. And I had heard over and over again, if you wanted to sell in Target or Walmart, for example, you had to be able to scale just to this massive level that most small entrepreneurs, small makers, especially those that were starting out, weren't capable of doing. And I, I remember at one point having a conversation with my marketing manager and I was like, you know, we're small too. <laughs> and we've got a little shelf space and it's, I'm much more approachable than trying to find a buyer at a, at a big box store. What can we do? And that was the initial conversation to bringing some stuff in, giving people shelf space, having pop-ups on our sidewalk, you know, just the visibility. If we could be the big guy um, and provide visibility for someone smaller by giving them a table on the sidewalk, uh, we wanted to be able to do that. And we did that for, for years, basically, until the pandemic hit. And it'll, I, the team will be starting that kind of um, experience for customers up again uh, now that we're through that. But yeah, it gave people visibility. If you're a small card maker, candle maker, uh, towel maker, if you think back to 2010, Union Kitchen was just starting. So there was an opportunity growing, but small at the time for small food makers. Um, places like the Spice Suite, which has blown up in Washington, D.C. now and is amazing, didn't exist in 2010 in the form that it does now. And so people who were making non-food products um, didn't have a place necessarily to go. We wanted to be that place for them. I know I don't, I'm obviously a member of the ACE Co-op and I'm very proud of that, but we, we identify locally as Logan Hardware, Glover Park Hardware, et cetera. But if, if you made something and you could put, I sold my product in an ACE hardware store, that looks really good to a buyer at a bigger establishment. So I wanted people to be able to, you know, name drop, if you will, <laughs> for whatever it was worth. It's so cool because I, I can only imagine how that brand, you know, would help those businesses scale and has helped oh, those businesses yeah. scale. Um, but also it shows the local connection for your business and gives your local customers what they want. And so I think yeah. more businesses could learn from that model. And it's something yeah. that I know a lot of your customers appreciate. Um, I'm curious, you know, if you could talk a little bit about some of the places that you've drawn inspiration, you know, maybe even outside of your own um, industry. I know you name some different people and some different businesses in the book, but we're always curious where folks, where leaders get inspired outside of their own circle or their own bubble. And I know you have some great stories to share. Yeah. So I have two and I, I, I could talk about these people all day long, but Father Gregory Boyle from Homeboys Industries in LA um, has been an enormous inspiration for me. And he uh, started a ministry, which is now this huge multi-million dollar nonprofit um, in LA with um, helping former gang members or gang members come, get off the street through job, jobs programs and, and a whole bunch of other things. But the one thing that he said that really resonated with me was even gangs have a culture. And when you start a business, the last thing a business owner should want is a culture that anybody would identify with being in a gang. Um, and you know we can talk more in detail about that, but I wanted to make sure that we had the opposite of what someone would think a gang culture was. And that really meant thoughtful planning. Um, so that was a big deal. Let's just, you know, to be thoughtfully planning our culture, um, so that it's, you know, it, it, cultures grow organically it, and not in a good way if you don't somehow support them. Um, I'm so, sorry, I'm babbling. And then the second one is Roberta McDonald from Cabot Creamery. So Roberta doesn't work at Cabot anymore, but she was the marketing powerhouse at Cabot Creamery which for those of you who don't know, is a, a cooperative in Vermont of 1,500 farmers, New England of 1,500 dairy farmers that make Cabot cheese, among other products. And so if you haven't had Cabot cheese, it's amazing. And um, oh, I'm losing my camera. Uh, Roberta called me one month and she said, uh, I want to ship you some cheese for a ladies' night, as a matter of fact. And I was like, who are you and where, why? 
Um, one of the principles of cooperatives, like I mentioned, is cooperating with other cooperatives. And she said, maybe at your parties, you can hand people cabbage cheese and talk about us being a cooperative. And that was it. I mean, I fell in love with her and she taught me more about the gorilla aspect and more about partnerships and more about finding these sort of odd connections that when the connection is clicked is no longer odd. And so that's been, a, she's been a huge influence on me. That's so cool. Yeah. Did, um, any of those leaders inform your thinking about your succession plans? And can you talk about that? Um, did they inform that? Not necessarily directly, but I just think through all of the lessons that I learned, um, you know, the homeboy industries is it's, Oh, you know what, actually, let me, let me back up for a second. Not those two specifically, but Zingerman's in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is one of uh, my favorite small businesses in the country, no longer that small. Um, Zingerman's decided they wanted to expand, but never outside of the county where Ann Arbor is, which I think is Clark County. And people wanted them to start their Zingerman's Deli in California and Florida. Like it was, a, it was famous. They wanted it. They wanted it to franchise. Anyway, Polinari said, nope we're going to grow. We have appetite for growth, but never outside of this County. And so they never grew until one of their teammates was ready to be the owner of the next business. And, you know, obviously we took it a little bit in, in a little bit different direction with the ESOP, but they knew that their growth and their success depended on having someone who was truly the owner of the next business and how they could support them. And so, um, they, they've made a huge impact on how we think about that. Yeah. And how do you influence the business? You're not running it day to day anymore now that you're chair of the board, but um, how do you, what are, what have you done over the last 20 years to influence how the business continues to maintain, you know, the values and the culture that are important to you? It's funny that you asked this question because today is exactly two weeks since I retired uh, as CEO. And I retired two weeks ago and immediately went on vacation. And so I didn't really feel it yet. So this is the second day of me feeling like, oh my God, what have I done? Um, I hope that I laid the foundation for a really strong culture. I mean, that's probably just the easiest way to answer that. I mean, I, I see it. I had a conversation with my successor earlier this morning and and he quoted me on something, which was so funny to hear him like, oh, you were listening that day. Like, I just, I still don't feel like I'm that person. I mean, again, you calling me a chief influencer was so flattering. I think part of it is just, I want people to maybe hear my voice or think about some of the things as a team we've talked about in group settings. Like, yeah, this is how we would do this. Or this, this might, this might be good for the team as well as the business. So I don't know. It's only been two weeks. We'll see. We'll see how it goes, but I, I, yeah, because you've done it without having to be physically there, you know, at all of those stores. And, and right, you know, for culture. sure. I think that's the yeah. secret. Um, what one thing that I wanted to mention before we wrap up your book, Recovery Hardware, is full of so many poignant stories. One that really um, stuck with me, which was about your team member, John, who you mentioned earlier, and he has since passed away. Um, he invited you to an event. And uh, at the end, he was the MC, and he said, I know I don't speak alone when I say that many in this room owe our sobriety to Logan Hardware. And then he asked the audience to applaud for you and Mark. Oh, I'm just getting chills. <laughs> like I, I got cute about yeah, it. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, that must have been such a very special moment for you and Mark. And um, I just wonder if you can just share a little bit about, you know, what that feels like to know you've made such an impact and influenced so many team members in a positive way and the community in a positive way. So one of the, I mean, there were so many special things about that day. So thank you for giving it some, some airtime. Um, Shane was the MC of that event. One of the MCs, John was the other. And so it was a very full circle moment going from when Shane started very fragile and, and new in his recovery uh, through all of the things that he's doing now, including business ownership, and then emceeing this big event, which was a drag show to raise money um, for uh, the recovery programs in Washington. And so we had teammates who were participating as performers. We had teammates, active current teammates who were in the audience. We had probably 20 teammates who had gone on to other things who were also in the audience. And so it was very special. You know, you, there's, you mentioned it, the rippling effect. 
I had never in my life thought about the rippling effect, honestly, until that moment when John said that. And we looked around the room and realized how many people we had, they had influenced us. I mean, this was all very mutual. Um, how many people in that room had somehow over the last, I guess it was 18 years at that point, had really made an impact um, on our growth and my leadership development, certainly Mark's leadership development. Um, yeah, it was awesome. And it was, it was really, it was one of John's last big activities before he passed away. And to see him in the spotlight, which is where he loved to be, was uh, something I'll never forget. You started the business with this idea of, you know, making some sort of impact in the community. You had no idea that the recovery piece was going to be part of it. And nope. then you made a huge impact in the community in many ways. You've built a community in many ways. I mean, there's just so much we I've learned from you and that we can learn from you. Just as a last Thank question, you. I know you mentor a lot of other business owners, other women, other people. I mean, you know, you're just a, a wonderful mentor to others. I just wonder what's the advice that you give um, protégés that you wish you had gotten 20 years ago? Oh, I, I, everything, Anthony. I mean, I knew nothing. <laughs> I love I love thinking back to how naive I was. Um, you, I was never afraid to ask a lot of questions. Like I had grown up believing that there was no such thing as a dumb question. And I obviously no one had to teach me this because this is how I already lived, but this is, it sounds super basic, but there are so many people that I've mentored or just met with and, and learned from myself who have been afraid to ask a question because they're so afraid of looking stupid or uninformed. And my pea brain somehow realized that it didn't matter how uninformed I was, that I was never going to grow if I didn't ask this question. And probably the funniest example from the early days, um, there are 25,000 items in our hardware store and there are about 5,000 in the nuts and bolts department. I don't know what any of those crazy things do. And I would block the aisle and ask my vendor to not leave until he explained to me at least two or three of them um, every single week when he came in. And that's a very basic example for growing a business. But you know, I tell folks, if you don't understand finance, ask the questions. Don't be afraid of how stupid you look or think you look, whatever. I mean, a good mentor is never going to think you're stupid. I'm always going to think that it's fantastic that you thought of any questions to ask. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. I love that. I think it's, it's, it's <laughs> I use question a lot. <laughs> such an important reminder. Thank you yeah. for letting me ask so many questions. Gina, it was uh, so incredible to read Recovery Hardware, having known a little bit about your business before and learned so much about it. It was an honor to get to spend time with you today. I just want to thank you uh, for being thank part you. of Chief Influencer and congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Bye. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Chief Influencer, a production of Social Driver and the Communications Board. If you know a leader who should be featured as a chief influencer, please nominate them at chiefinfluencer.org. For show notes and more, visit us at chiefinfluencer.org or follow Chief Influencer on LinkedIn. Until next time.